right, everybody, welcome back to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. And as we like to do on Fridays is uh, talk about transformation, uh, as in Transformation Fridays, which is our hashtag. And today we have Sasha Rosenbaum, otherwise known as Divine Ops, which I love <laughs> the handle. I didn't think about that one. Um, but yes, and we're going to talk today about something that's a bit near and dear to my heart. And I know Sasha and Jay Bloom is with us and Chris Short is with us. So we're going to have a conversation today, but uh, around creating allies and allyship and, and, and how to do that and how to create healthy, engaged relationships in all of these technology communities and elsewhere um, in the universe. And so I'm going to let Sasha introduce herself, talk for a little while, and then we're going to all jump in. So take it away, Sasha. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Okay. Um, around technology stuff, it seems like I'm on air, so this is good. You are on air, so go for it. <laughs> All right. Good. Um, so I'm Sasha Rosenbaum. Um, I work for GitHub. I uh, worked for Microsoft before that for about five years. So I um, started my career as a developer and then kind of got involved in Opsy stuff and then um, became a part of the DevOps community. Um, so kind of a big road there, and I'm right now a product manager, um, and I do a lot of things that are related to DevRel. So basically held um, every possible job, I think. I was also in technical sales for a while. So basically, I think I held every possible job in the industry. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a couple more I'll add to the list uh, over time. Um, I also, so I was born in Ukraine back when it was Soviet Union, and then on um, I made a journey to Israel where I lived for a little over a decade and now I'm about a decade in the United States. So, um, and that's relevant to the whole conversation, I think, um, because basically ha having the experience in different cultures kind of um, expands your horizons on how you talk to people and how you appreciate where they're coming from. I think, um, I want this to be a conversation, so I don't want to, to you know, preach. I, I love being on a soapbox, but I don't want to preach about this because I think this in particular is a thing that we are trying to solve as a community, right? Like creating allyship and especially in the current political climate, kind of, you know, bringing people together rather than pushing them apart. And so I would prefer us to, to have a conversation about this right now then me just um, be on a stage. I don't know how you all feel about that. <laughs> I'm totally okay with it. And I think it's really, it's interesting. Um, communities come in so many different layers. I mean, you've just described moving from, from Russia and Ukraine to Israel to this and the things that we learn as children um, and as uh, teenagers and through school and through the different communities that we engage in Gage in that help us um, adapt and bring in other people into, you know, make new friends when we go to new schools and other things. So there's some, it's almost like those lessons that people talk about, um, things you knew in kindergarten, but you forgot, right? So the elementary school, the very basic things that make us human um, and want to connect with each other. And, tr and we learn the skills to connect. Um, from our peers and from our parents and from our communities. And maybe um, if we can talk about it a little bit from, from that perspective, what you learned um, because you moved so many times. And so you had to go into different communities. Yeah, so I think a lot of times we forget, and like it, it's, it sounds like a common like knowledge that cultures change throughout time and throughout Face, right? But we don't really appreciate the power of that. So a lot of times I always see people say, oh, how person X could say the such and such words. And then they have to step back and be like, well, they're from a different country with a very different background and they don't have the same cultural norms. But we forget that and we kind of expect everyone to be on the same page about everything, right? So it's like a perpetual playing catch up. Now, that doesn't mean that you can sort of let people get away with bad behavior just because of where they're coming from, right? But I do think that 
a lot of times, sometimes it's like the lack of ed education. No one ever told someone about, I don't know, toxic masculinity, right, in certain cultures. Um, it's a normal thing. People express themselves that way. And they maybe if you had a conversation about this and explained it in a non sort of argumentative, non alienating way, we could get on onto the common ground. Um, but we kind of cut it off from the beginning. It's especially, I think, on social media and on the internet in general, we can take out the civility out of the conversation, right, and, and become immediately sort of take sides and take out all the shades of gray, um, which we can rant about this, but it's an impossible to um, solve, right? It, like, the shades of gray are never going to be there on, in online conversations. So I will say, like, I definitely censor myself in some ways because I know that certain things will be misconstrued in certain ways, right? So I can't say, even though like opinions have like more, you know, shades of grace to them. Yeah. So it, it, part of it, it and you know, the toxic masculinity, even those two words together, the language and having the common language to discuss topics of allyship and creating connections across it. People don't, realize um you know some of its cultural some of its education a lot of its language um, and having these concepts key core concepts that we share and can communicate without uh, um, offending people really um, and it taking on the responsibility of edu educating we talk a lot about trolls and other things um, people who especially in online conversations I, you talk a little bit about censorship and I know that I self center like self censor like crazy um, through my Python DJ one because it's a work one right so it's it, it, there's two levels of censorship there's censorship because I know people who are watching and listening to it um, for for work stuff. Uh, Red Hat has a bit of a policy of not being nasty um, and not, you know, not trashing your enemies um, or your competitors, rather. Um, they're not enemies. They're just collaborators, future ones. But um, there's a lot of education that we have that we have to do uh, in some ways um, coming from um, LGBTQ um, or a woman or Black Lives Matters, different communities that we're in um, that we have to teach each other the language that we and have a mutual language to, to discuss these topics in. And I know, Jabe, you've been on here before with Demege, um, and there's a lot of uh, conversations around social justice um, and not just that some of it flows um, as well in technology, but the work that, that Demege and Jabe have been doing really has helped give us, a, give me, some insights into the languages that we need to be sharing um, beyond just um, just the basics, you know. And I think that's that's been really key. Yeah. I think, like you know, when I listen to Sa some of what Sasha's saying, you know, there's a it's an idea it's got, uh, that's called cosmopolitan localism, and so cosmopolitanism is like. Mm, roughly gl global culture like the the fact that you're part of the human race the fact that you exist on the planet with other humans uh the fact that you are part of a, a cosmos or, or a universe right um and localism is more about like i live in pittsburgh and therefore pittsburgh influences who i am and the language and culture that i express because that's my li like my local loop right um, and so there's this idea of like um, existing on multiple different levels of granularity as an individual. And of course, um, to some extent, uh, <clears throat> the cosmopolitan levels end up forcing kind of more universal conversations, right? Like uh, they, they force conversations uh, and they like, it's hard to have a fight about whether or not Pittsburgh's better than Chicago. I mean, we can, but it's not not going to not going to nobody's going to win that fight, right? Like, I mean, and not just that, but it tends to be kind of, I think, in at least in culture, arguments about like Pittsburgh versus Philadelphia or San Francisco versus New York. These tend to be like 
fine. The U.S. Like, versus Russia, right? Like, yeah. 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 So, the, <laughs> so, but they're they're kind of like long-standing, like you know, comparisons. They're not. They don't tend to be completely overblown. Now, talk about what universally good things are. Things get really wacky, right? Like, you you should you should never be able to do this. You should never be able to do that. All all sorts of different variations on that, right? Um, so we get these kind of multiple levels, and and part of what ends up happening, I think, to kind of relate it to what Diane was just talking about, is that those those big stories, those cosmological stories, um, uh, they don't have um, language or pointers in those stories to allow certain ways of being in the world to be seen. Yeah. Now that changes over time, but for instance, like. Uh, LGBTQ peoples have frequently been not part of the cosmological story. They've been hidden. They've been erased. They've been, you know, removed from that. Women in technology for the last 30 years, their contributions to the not only the technology itself but the culture of technology erased. Right, and so part of like becoming an ally, part of working with others to become allies is to say it's important to to reveal and unerase certain other ways of being in the world and that there's not we don't need to all be the same we need to be accepting of other ways of being in the world um but we also need to reveal them so that they can be seen and you know this is this is the kind of i think one of the really interesting observations of something called epistemic justice and and, and in epistemic justice theory there's a concept called hermeneutical justice and it basically says um it's not when you're when you are allying with um young african-american black women to to be uh capable or uh be seen in, in technology you're not just like opening a space for them you're you're helping them to make sense of themselves in relation to other stories by actually showing them where they where they are in the story, that they that they can be part of the story. And I think one of the ways to kind of think through that really quickly is just sexual kind of uh, sexual assault, sexual violence, um, uh, sexual harassment in particular, those terms did not exist before the 70s. The, the term sexual harassment um, uh, came up because a woman, was sexually harassed by her boss at work at a university, and she felt uncomfortable by that, although she couldn't describe what was happening. She just was like, this doesn't make me feel good. So she left, and she tried to get unemployment, and the unemployment people said, well, why did you leave your job? And she said, personal reasons, and because that was the best she could do to describe it. And uh, they said, you don't, get, you don't get any unemployment. You can't just leave. And she went back to the university and talked to a bunch of, of women, uh, particularly lawyers, about this problem. Can I get help? Is can a lawyer help me with this? And all the lawyers were like, that, that whoa, that happens to everybody. That happens to me. But uh, we've never been able to talk about it before because there's no handle. There's no story to pass around that what we're, so sexual harassment not only became a concept in legal terminology, but it actually became a cultural concept that allowed women to say and make sense of their experiences. I'm being harassed. This isn't okay. And be, prior to having that terminology, you could feel uncomfortable, but you couldn't express it. And more particularly, it's hard to make sense of what's happening to you. So. Again, I think allyship and the development of these languages and stories and narratives and the unerasure of people is partially about helping them to make sense of what who who they are in the world, what they'd like to be in the world, and how they want to change the stories. How how now they are a character in the story that can change the story, as opposed to like I can see there's a story happening over there that I'm nothing I'm not part of that. Um, and I think that's. Oh. Okay, you you had said so many things that I want to dive into, and like there's like so many layers. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick on a couple. So in terms of um, being cosmopolitan, so 
we we can see if we look at history, we can see like this populist movement, right? And then it kind of goes up and down, right? And actually, the worse the situation in a country is, the more like economic unrest or something like that is happening, the more populist autocratic goes up, right? And then it kind of go, comes and goes in waves. But we also like if we take the tide all together, we can see that we're moving progressively towards globalization, right? The the cultures become bigger, the countries become bigger. We used to be, you know, really small tribes, and then we became the kingships and like, you know, knightships, and then it became countries, and it, it keeps expanding. And so, a lot of people right now are saying like, well, we couldn't you know, make the world work globally, right? There's no global law, there's no global um, ethics standards and stuff like that. But I think we can, right? Because again, if we look through history, we can see that it's progressively becoming more cosmopolitan. But the problem with humans is um, it's really hard to exist on these multiple levels. And it's really hard to make sense of all of it. And it was really easy to say, my tribe is right and my God is the right God and my way of living is the right way of living. And when I have to hold in my head the all the multiple ways in which people function and all the multiple beliefs that don't agree with one another and how do I not offend anybody, um, it becomes really difficult, right? And and that kind of creates this like pushback, right? I, I now want to close up. I want to be um, you know loyal to just my small tight, tightly knit groups b- b- group because it makes sense to me. Um, I think, and, and we can't, you know, all move through 15 different countries to experience the world, right? Um, <laughs> I, I think it's about basically psychological safety, um, right? And, and so it, it kind of becomes this thing where um, people on all sides of this conversation are not feeling enough psychological safety to express themselves. And okay. go ahead. You bring up a great point in the sense that we can't move like most people can't move about countries like freely, like maybe you have or, you know, other people have. But uh, you can move about your own country pretty freely, no matter what. And what I've seen here in the United States across my journeys across the country back and forth is that there's all these microcosms. There's all these bubbles. Right. And they all exist in their own little way. And even between my community here And the city of Detroit, 40 minutes away, those bubbles are vastly different, right? And it's it as a crow flies, it's only a few miles. And the 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 cosmopolitan nature or, you know, kind of underlying thinking and feeling of the community is completely different. So just getting out and experiencing things that are outside your bubble is vitally important on your journey in life, in my opinion. But the, I really, I actually really like the the psychological safety concept yes. here because I think you've hit on something, Sasha. That's that's really important. Is that when people feel threatened, or people feel scared, or their economic viability, or their physical safety isn't there, and psychological safety is a big part of it. And what I'd like to tease out a little bit is is how how can we come from? Obviously, we come from. Um, places of privilege, um, and we and we use our power to elevate our um, folks and create these bubbles, or not bubbles, but these psychological safety um, for people. And, and maybe from some of your experience in DevRel world and other places, if you can talk a little bit about how you actually can go about helping people and creating those spaces. So I'm gonna do a politician's move and not answer the question, but go somewhere else. And then I hope, last but, night. But I, I hope I hopefully we'll come back to this because this is a very interesting question. Um, but so there's a book that I wanted to bring up um, that was recommended by our mutual friend, actually Kat Swell, to me, um, and it's it's called The Righteous Mind, and it has some useful ideas for this conversation. So I just want to kind of point them out first. So one is that it's essentially been proven by research that we don't actually reason about moral issues, right? We make a snap judgment based on our emotions, and then we move on from that and backtrack, um, assign reasoning to why this is actually the right thing, right? So if I see someone 
hidden a child, I'm not thinking about whether hidden a child is the right thing to do, right? I have a snap judgment, this is bad, right? And if I lived in biblical times and, you know, there was the uh, whatever, the don't withhold a rod from your child type of mentality around me, maybe my snap judgment would be different and I would react to it differently. And again, this exemplifies the fact that people coming from different cultures and you can definitely like different countries on this globe right now are in different stages of this journey. Right. So like this whole big um, thing to you know address here. But so the second very useful idea that comes from this book and that maybe can provide a way for us to talk about this is that people have. So essentially the assumption is that we have moral foundations and we get we essentially have like five different moral foundations and they're like taste buds so like we're born with predisposition to relate to these ideas right so it's um care harm right fairness cheating loyalty betrayal authority subversion and sanctity de degradation so i said a lot of words big words um but so the idea in the book that is underscored is that um, the more liberal leaning people are relying on the care and fairness. Right. So we want to take care of as many people as possible. We want to create justice for all. We want to um, save people who are being harmed, um, give more rights to LGBTQ community or whatever it is. Right. We, we want to create more justice, more fairness. Um, and then the people on the right side of the spectrum they tend to lean on the loyalty and authority and sanctity more, right? And loyalty and authority, we just talked about it, right? We just talked about loyalty. I'm from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the best. U.S. is the best, right? Um, I, my redhead is the best. Like whatever, whatever it is, right? My small group is the group that wins and you're all wrong, right? And then in terms of authority, so we have a system that society works in. Um, and it's a hierarchical system, right? And someone in that hierarchy is on a, on a bottom and someone's on a top, right? And so this whole conversation, like it, it always comes to this. When, when you hear people being radicalized by this argument, it's always about one person is arguing about fairness, so we shouldn't hurt the people on the bottom of the hierarchy. And the other person is arguing about loyalty. So this system worked for us for 2000 years. Why are we trying to disrupt it? Right. And so the argument doesn't even agree because both sides kind of decide based on emotions. And then I can start bringing up. So if I'm on the conservative side of this, I will start bringing up arguments like, well, people who are hurt are des deserving of that hurt. We're actually having meritocracy. This is how the world works, whatever, right? I actually mm -hmm. find ways to dismiss the fairness arguments because I'm coming from a completely different thing, right? So I, I want to hear what you all think about this before we continue. I, I mean, Diane, if you want to weigh in, go ahead. But I, I mean, I can talk about it if you want. Go for the, it. The, the idea that, like, we have to be beholden to the things we've done in the past is something that I've literally spent the past like two decades trying to destroy, mm -hmm. like in my mind, in my own self. So I know it is hard to do, but it is possible, right? Like if you look at DevOps, look at how many organizations have changed and just digitally transformed the way they do work, right? The way they release code. They've changed the way they thought about Absolutely. safety in general and sped things up, right? So I know that this change is possible in the mind of a human. It's just how do we get it outside of these small little things like tech or like how to do something, right, and get it into a larger kind of global globalization kind of mindset. Well, so for, for think, one, hold on, I'm, I'm going to respond to this. Um, so for one, there's obviously like if you're on the top of the hierarchy, it's going to be really hard for me to convince you that you should change the system right right but it's not just that you can find people on every level being very loyal to the system and mm -hmm. so it that again that also comes from that book uh there's a study on how people vote and they don't vote in their best interest people vote with their community 
So I belong to the community. I, I align myself to the, the ideas. So if I'm in the DevOps community and I know that my community has my back, I'm now defending the DevOps ideas because I feel that psychological safety and I feel that people are behind me, right? If I went ahead and said something that differs from that community, right, and I tried to defend an opposite idea, then I just lost my kinship, I lost my community, I lost my tribe, I'm alone in the darkness and I'm upset, right? And maybe the idea that I had had merit, but it doesn't really matter if I die alone in the darkness of hunger, right? Like, ugh. So oh, um, incentives, right? It's it's always about incentives. Um, and I go ahead. I was going to that point. It's it's interesting because you know, we're all in the tech communities too. So um, like I've been doing platform as a service and cloud infrastructure stuff for almost ten years now. And so back in the dark ages, I actually worked um, on a distribution of cloud foundry, and um, so there was the whole Cloud Foundry versus OpenShift versus every other platform in the service in the beginning days. And and it, and it we watched as the whole, and, and there was a lot of loyalty, trust me. There was a like, Cloud Foundry's better, Pivotal's great, Red Hat's wonderful, OpenShift. And, and I actually switched teams, which was really interesting. I've done that a few times in my life. But um, there's, a, there's, there's a thing that's happening now, I think, in tech, and part of it, um, it comes from, and I was just giving a talk a few hours ago um, about cross-community collaboration and how we've had to change our whole mind with the whole, and I think um, I give a lot of credit to um, the Cloud Foundry, not the Cloud, the Cloud Native Foundation for creating the space and, and to do this um, cross-community collaboration, to have the innovations from different projects um, and the interrelatedness of all of the projects and the what I, what I call the in-betweenness, the centrality of um, the different people who are in the different projects and the people who are the connector personas. And those people are the ones that I think I have learned the most from, like identifying people who maybe have loyalty to a project that um, is a competing project, but also are able to connect um, me to that technology, to understand their roadmap, their vision. So, you, you know, we often see that and I think it plays out in the real world, as not that tech isn't the real world, but in the real world as well, as finding people like yourself, Sasha and Jabe and Chris, um, who connect us through these different projects and help us understand the, um, the world views, the loyalties, the, um, you, know, who, you know, what the layers are. And that's really, I think, one of the things that um, is changing now. I think before we were in our, I, I, I come from open source community development. So we were in our individual project camps, shall we say, um, so to apply this. Or if we're even within Red Hat, we were in our individual silos. Are you in middleware? Are you in OpenShift? And what we're, what we're seeing um, and how some of this allyship we see play out in tech um, and now in the greater communities um, outside of in the world and the politics today that we see between in the US between Republicans and Democrats is that's the missing thing is who are those connector people who can make it um, and help create those spaces for us to um, hear the other people's side. And, and that I think is the thing that we have to work on more. Go for it, Sasha. So I think like what I, if we were talking about like organizational transformation, stuff like that, I like to look at incentives and I like to look at the f common goals, right? So the whole like DevOps movement, the reason it made sense was because we said, oh, we're not like one, one person's working to keep the lights on and the other person's looking to do the most changes and break the most things. Surprise, we're working to deliver software to people, to deliver value to them, right? And we are all incentivized to do that. And keeping the lights on or pushing new changes is just part of it. Now, it helps that speed and quality turns out actually go together and they work together. And that's awesome. And now we have these numbers and we don't even have to, you know, appeal to the higher nature, but we can just show people data. But um, it, it's, it's about that. Now, in terms of incentives, 
so back in the day, we when we came in and we said, you know, we can automate all of your deployment or whatever, people said, like, I'm going to lose my job, right? My job's going to go away. You're automating me out of a job. And so I, I didn't, you know, I didn't say, like, oh, automating you out of a job is a good thing, right? I said, oh, instead of doing these, you know, checklists every day, every single time, or spending your week- weekend trying to fix bugs or whatever, you're going to do more interesting things, right? Like, your job is going to be better. Now, this doesn't always work. Like, this this doesn't always apply to all levels in society, but it definitely applies to our jobs and technology, right? Whenever we automate someone out of a job, it usually gives them a better job um, to do. So if you dress up the the things that you want to accomplish – um, as in they're good for you, that usually works. <laughs> you usually gain allyship in that way. Now, I, I just I want to say um, basically one more thing, and that is in terms of creating allies in general, like in a company, in a community, in the world, um, there's two things that I like the most. Personally, it's one is helping people. So that sounds obvious, right? But helping people really helps you build trust and relationships and as people help you back. But the other thing that is interesting is asking for people help actually works just the same, maybe even better. Um, And I think, especially in the beginning of your career, it's kind of hard to um, go and ask people for help. You kind of like, oh, well, well, they will think I don't know things and they will doubt me and whatever. But actually asking questions is has been one of the best things that you like I could do for my career because um, a it helps you because you get answers. And so, you know, I can Google how to solve a problem for three hours or I can ask Chris who's done this before and he will tell me. And he he has already experienced all the pain that goes into, you know, trying a bunch of different solutions. And he will point me to the right one right at the gate. And that saves both of us a lot of time, especially me. Uh, the other thing that happens is that Chris is going to feel really good about himself. And that's a great thing to happen, right, both for Chris and for me, because now Chris likes me. So, you know. Uh, I I know it maybe sounds manipulative to that, to an extent, but it really works. Like if you wanted to build an allyship with a person and they were kind of immune to everything that you were doing, like ask them for a favor. <laughs> oh yeah, that's that's a that's yeah. a great one. So I think I think you know the other thing uh, just to kind of like reflect a, a little bit on like DevOps and, and some of the previous parts of the conversation. Um, so there's, there's these two big ideas uh, in, in my head. One's, one's called universalism and one's called pluriversalism. And so universalism is the idea that we all live in the same universe, say, the same story, uh, the same dominant story exists, and we all have to figure out how we fit into that universal story. Pluriversalism says, mm, that's not actually true. There's no way that the entire world kind of actually comes together on the same timeline. There's multiple um, experiences that people are having and you shouldn't actually try to optimize the world for universalism you should try to optimize it for pluriversalism so what why why do i say that why do i talk about when i'm talking about devops i think there's two ways to look at devops one is that you want to develop a universalist version of devops which is roughly like devops culture inside of an organization is that the developers and operators share a complete understanding of the universe that is that they share that understanding. And therefore, like the developers understand the operators and the operators understand the developers. And you know, you you might end up in those arguments leaning towards conversations like no ops, because if we all are the same, then why do we need others? We just need more developers, right? On the other hand, you look at DevOps as a pluriversal system, and then there's a different kind of question and that is like is there a developer culture and an operator culture and then this third shared set of values and that what the goal isn't to actually smash everything into one way of thinking about the world it's to have is to have enough shared common ground understanding of what's happening in our organizations so that we reduce the friction that occurs because I literally don't have a clue what's happening across the wall of confusion, right? 
And that, that's different. And what, why I think it's important to notice the difference between these two things is uh, to point back to, to Chris's comments about traveling. The value of traveling is experiencing other ways of being, and the value of experiencing other ways of being is to understand your own way of being better, like to understand your own existence a little bit better by having contrasts and frictions that are interesting. And so, I, I you know, one of the things I try to say about DevOps all the time is, DevOps isn't about making developers into operators, and it's not about making operators into developers. Although, by the way, it's probably more about making operators slightly more developer-ish. But anyway. Okay, well, um, we've, crea we've created the job title. We can just give up and admit that. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea here is that I think if you do DevOps well, the point of the developers interacting with the operators isn't to become better operators. It's to become better developers and vice versa. The point of the operators interacting with the developers is to become better operators. And it's the, it's the friction between the two cultures and the way in which it reveals difference and the, the fact that operators do different things than developers do and developers do different things than operators do. And those are, those are, that's not what we're trying to eliminate. We're not trying to homogenize organizations. We're trying to make multiple simultaneous cultures exist inside the organization without causing tribal wars to occur. And that's the challenge to me. And that's why I think about allyship and things like that and bridging and things like that. It's not to integrate the two cultures. It's to make them productive in relationship to each other. So bridging, bridging. And yeah. that goes back to the original bits that we were talking, I think I mentioned creating a common language um, and sharing and educating across, um, across the silos, across the community walls, across um, cultural walls and and community walls, and I think that's that's the thing that um, asking the question, Sasha, um, asking for a favor, asking for things that are bridging tools um, that open up conversations, that create these spaces for people to get a better understanding of what's going on on the other side of the wall. It's not. Uh, yeah, it's not always about breaking down the wall. Um, it's about giving a language so people know what's going on in the other room, right? Um, mm -hmm. But and I think those I are think... the things. Go ahead. There's Sorry. A, there's, a, there's a great um, uh, Ursula Le Guin book called *The Dispossessed*, and in the book, um, there is two different worlds, right? Uh, there and they're closely aligned. And one is basically a highly authoritarian world and one is an anarchistic world, right? And one of the most important kind of symbols in the book is that the, the highly authoritarian world sends a rocket occasionally over to the anarchistic world and the rocket lands and there is a stone wall around where the rocket lands that is the boundary. And in it, she kind of describes how it's not a thin line, it's actually like a, a space where they can meet together and 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 that is what a boundary is it's not kind of like a it's not a wall that separates them it's a place of negotiation it's a boundary and a way of, but that doesn't unify them it it's like a cell wall it allows the right kind of nutrients to move back and forth between the part subsystems while still maintaining the subsystems i think it's just such an interesting book and everybody should read it and that's one of my favorites but anyway and I, I do absolutely love the author. Um, I um, So I wanted to come back to something that Diane said and Jabe said um, about language and visibility. So I think this is really important. And part of the reason I'm on, like, probably the biggest reason I'm on stage ever is representation, right? I want to be there so people see me, so people know they can be like me. So people who look like me can, you know, be like me in the future. Um, and... I think I, I've I thought about this a lot in, in terms of role models and like how I'll, I'll take the example of sexism because it's something in personal experience. Right. I spent a couple of decades not noticing that sexism existed. Like I, I was literally like I didn't know that it was there. Right. And then I spent another, I don't know, five years being like, well, I, I guess half of my life basically being like, I'm not like them other girls. 
right? And that was my tagline, right? I'm, I'm just not like them. Like, I like computers because I'm not like other girls. Like, it, it just made sense. Yep. And then I, hmm. I have experiences where I go back to, like, books I read as a kid, and I'm like, this is so sexist. Like, it's incredibly awful. Like, how did I not notice this? And I will tell you how I didn't notice this. I didn't associate myself with the princes, right? I associated myself with the prince because, like that was the only role model I could have. I could not associate myself with a invisible woman in the in the script. It just because it it just her 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 existence was to be a painting on the wall. Um, and this is about visibility, right? Like visibility in language to describe your experiences and representation in terms of having people know that it's safe to be themselves. Right, and that they can accomplish certain things while still being themselves. Now, the thing is, the thing that like, and I don't know if I want to go into this because it's dangerous territory, but um, we're not actually, so all the groupings that we have are absolutely arbitrary. Like gender is a social construct. And I, I don't think we talk about this enough. We keep assigning new labels and, and saying like, people are like, People like this are called that and whatever. But um, in reality, each one of us has different traits and different, you know, desires and different understanding of the world. And we just can't get that granular. So we keep grouping people together. Um, but in my idealistic world, like that pluralism would be at the individual level. Like I can be whatever I want and you don't have to assign me a tag and, you know, um, but yeah, I think like we're kind of far from there, but but we're making strides towards it. And I, and I think it's a good thing. Um, and, and again, like just. There's another idea that I want to quote because it's a it's a really nice idea. Um, it comes from Sapiens by Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari, and it kind of explains some things to me because um, I was thinking about the fact that like men have like as much requirements of how to be a man that that women as women have of how to be a woman right but we are talking about sexism in you know as oppression of women and at the opposite side um and the reason for that is like he says in the book is like if you conform to being a man if you 100 percent execute on what a man should be you win the game if you conform to being a woman and execute 100 percent on what a woman should look like you lose again. You're at a loss. You're at a down in the hierarchy and you have a problem. And that is true in like racism as well, right? It's it's true of the hierarchical systems and positions. The problem isn't that like there's no toxic masculinity and men are not told that they're not allowed to cry or whatever and, and not experience certain levels of personal oppression. They do. Um, but they have an option to opt out and like opt in into the game and win it, whereas like some other people do not, right? Okay. <laughs> and, so there's this, that, there's, this, and, there's this really yeah. good book by a guy named Herbert Dreyfus called All the Things Shining. And the point of the book is roughly this. Uh, one of the things that the Greeks had was a polytheistic system. And therefore, like, if you wanted to explain yourself, um, you could say, like, I'm under the thrall of the god of love right now. Therefore, I'm passionate and I want to, you know, meet with people. Um, uh, but now I'm all of a sudden under the god of war and I want to kill people. And, and and I can switch my personalities. And it's totally rational to switch my personality because all I'm doing is saying – uh, the God that I used to be enthralled to, it, it, I'm not, I'm not paying attention to him anymore. I'm paying attention to her now. Right. Um, and one of the things that happens in Western culture is we move to a monotheistic God, a, a universal system with one concept of what goodness is. And therefore your idea of being able to switch personalities is challenged because I still have to serve this primary set of ethical standards. Even if I claim that I've changed my personality, I can't radically change my personality like I could in the Greek times. Anyway, it's, it's a good book. You guys should all read it. You'd like it. Uh, 
we're, we're going to end up with a bibliography at the end of this talk. I know, right? Like, <laughs> I, I keep having to hunt for like book titles and like dropping links in the uh, the live stream chats, and it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many books in here. <laughs> but but I want to go back a little bit too to what Sasha said because um, it's been was my experience too. When I read books as a kid, I I probably never picked the princess as the person that I envision when you project yourself into a book um, and. And I think there's another thing that I, I, it's an old saying somewhere about if you, if you don't see yourself in the room, then you don't visual, you, you don't, if you don't see someone who looks like yourself in the room, you can't visualize yourself being in that room. And so like Sasha and, and other folks is, is being, getting other people on the podium uh, mm -hmm. so that others can see them on, on the podium and see themselves reflected back in the conversations that we're having has been really one of the, the things that I've been keen to do with all these new tools that we have um, for virtual worlds. We've democratized the access to all of this stuff. So now we should actually leverage that to bring more people and make people more visible where they want to be and empower them. Go ahead, Sasha. Yeah, so I just wanted to add to the why representation matters. And in addition to that is we stereotype by default, right? Our minds stereotype, like it, there's nothing we can do about this because like we must generalize and can't treat every sort of circumstance on its own. And that's why representation matters because if I don't see anyone who looks like me on that stage, I can't visualize, you know, me being on that stage. And then if, if I saw roughly 50% of women in tech, then I wouldn't be you know, arguing that women are biologically disinclined to work with computers or that what the hell people argue. Um, so it's just normalizing people of certain that look a certain way, for lack of better description, being in certain spaces, right? Exactly. Absolutely. I, I think that's for me, um, because the whole topic here today and, and welcome, Andrew, um, the, the whole topic here was about. Hello creating allies and allyship and you know we we've wandered into PhD territory and other other places um and it's great this, this is should, exactly should allow Jabe to join yeah, we, we brought Jabe in, and so we went we went to that higher level too but I also think that um one of the things um that we um really what, what I want to tease out a little bit more too is um how we, with the DevOps and the Dev, you know, maybe DevRel and other things, we've we've had a lot of tools and a lot of the capability um, to to help bring other people to the forum. But we still have so much more to do, and I'm um, just would love to hear Sasha and Andrew uh, where where we can do more um, in terms of raising up visibility, creating more spaces, and 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 what the because I, I know you've had a lot of ex success in the DevOps days and other places um, and, and what else you would would share with people to, to do to, to help um, to create that visibility in that space it's one thing to say we need to do it but how are you how would you do that go about that so I don't, so from personal experience I think I, I was thinking about this because like I belong to different like I like I said I, I held a lot of different jobs in tech right um, but I'm part of only one community for real, and that's the DevOps Days community, right? Um, and I was questioning, like, why did I blend there and not say .NET community or whatever the hell it was? Um, and the reason is because I had people who were allies to me. Um, like, I came there and people hugged me and, and I stayed because, like, that was a welcoming place where I had psychological safety and all that stuff. Um, and so what I think I want to do is hug people back, like hug new people, right? Um, I think, so like if, if I take Twitter, um, you know how lots of people on Twitter have this like, oh, I want to be followed by cool kids. Like I want to be able to have conversation with cool kids. I think what matters to me is when I have a conversation with someone who is less privileged than me, and I can see that I've gained their trust. Like I, they can talk to me and not be scared that I'm going to dismiss their feelings or, you know, just imply that they don't belong in some way. Um, 
and like that's what like me personally i'm trying to create a situation in which people with less privilege than me can feel safe to express themselves which goes back to that psychological safety conversation earlier uh Aaron, is, is creating those places where we can connect and create these spaces and listen for them um, and and reach out and, that, and use the privileges that we have and the technologies that we have to connect with people. And I think that's even more so now with COVID and everything else that's going on, it's really important to do that and to, to reach out. So I know so this Andrew- is, This is a bit of a counterpoint maybe, or, or I don't think it is. It's actually just kind of thinking about a different part of the system or a different level of the system. I, I, I love events, I love, you know, communities, you know, I'll hug people, this kind of stuff. I think that you have to look at the, the dynamics of the power that these things all rest in, right? And mm -hmm. I, I, I really believe in representation and putting people on the stage and, and I've done as much of that as I, as I could or as I was conscious and, and capable of. But, but when you look at the, 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 the systems that create these dynamics, the, the power is actually above that. And, and, and these kind of representations of putting someone on the stage is somewhat superficial when you don't have representation at, at the board level, at the C-suite, at the management level. Like, so there's, there's all this other work that I think that we have to do. And we're, we're all at kind of different levels um, of, of access to that and, and, and being able to facilitate that. But I think that's the work that needs to be done over the, like, do we change the dynamics of the system? And another thing, and I don't know if this was brought up earlier, you know, I had internet problems all morning, so I'm sorry I'm late. But I, I think sometimes there's this, there's this weird conversation that is hard to, hard to have about the, what, what actually ends up happening in a lot of cases when you look at the, the rings of power and privilege is that the, the people that are representative that are most like the people that already have the power and privilege sort of come next. So it's like sort of expanding out in rings. So it's like you have, you know, power dynamics, and he is having internet connection issues. Yeah, he go. <laughs> there he, and there he goes. Um, and yeah, he'll probably be back in a second or two. Um, so we'll we'll do that. I, there he comes. Hello. Finish that thought, Andrew. Sorry, I'm going to blame I'm going to blame the internet again. Um, so so I, I think that we we just have a lot of work to do about all the systems, all the power dynamics, and be careful not to just make the privilege go to the people that are the most like the people that have the power, but also slightly different, to, to really look at diversity at the basic level of, of what that means and try, try to expand it more holistically than just, oh, that person sort of talks and sounds like this, but they have a different skin color or a different gender, so we'll invite them to the, to the party. So this, there's one, um, like you touched on DevOps, Sasha and how you know you were welcomed into the community and they hugged you and then like for me I'm a little bit older and so for me that was the Python community and the Django community they were just you know amazing and they did a lot of work you know a long time ago around diversity and inclusivity but then there's another conference that um, that I go to now Lesbians Who Tech LWT if you can find them and they have um, done some really amazing work that I think um, one of the things that you, you touch on is that there, we, we, we tend to sometimes think that we're, what we're doing is putting a representative person, like we pick the one LGBTQ person, put them on, the one person of couple, co color and put them on the stage or, or whatever it is, and we think we're doing the work. But this, <clears throat> excuse me, this other conference that I go to and, and I love, they have a, a thing, they don't put it that way, they put it the way, I'm trying to get the, I, I'm sure they have a better phrase for it, um, that we're out there. There, you know, we're actually, we do exist in the tech community. You can put 50, you can, if you actually actively work, you can find 50% women of color to put on stage to have as your keynotes, and you can find trans people, and you can find people from disadvantaged. There, we actually are here um, in your communities. We just, the it's, it's doing, getting the organizers or the, the folks to actually recognize us and see us is really, I think, one of the things. Go for it, Sasha. I think, so I, I want to, so for one, for the expanding in rings, I think the gradual change is okay and that we can come back to that. I don't like revolution, so we can come back to that topic. It's a whole other topic. Um, but um, 
in terms of putting people on stage, this is inspired by recent experiences that make me really mad, but people who get on stage get attacked. Um, they yeah. are putting themselves in danger. Um, and I recently had an experience of putting someone, an amazing person on stage who got attacked pretty much for what they look like. Um, and that person is in, at a level in their career and their journey where they could just shrug it off and be like, you know, this is absolutely fine. I'm not in danger. Um, someone that person, like the person who was attacking them went as far as emailing their employer with some absolute bullshit things to say. But um, that's what I want to say in terms of putting 50 LGBTQ people on stage. Like, I can't put a junior, like, I was just thinking about, like, I invited a junior engineer, um, you know, before on stage and, like, and I'm like, what if that happened to that junior engineer? What if that happened to that person who didn't have the stance, who didn't feel comfortable with their, you know, where they are? Like, I, I would literally be responsible for putting them in danger. Um, and so th this is very, very sad and very um, horrible, but I have to think about that. And so I think lifting people up is not as obvious and easy to do as we think it is. Correct. A absolutely. And I, and I think that's where um, creating healthy, safe spaces to do that and doing that um, and in a way that engages the community um, that you're representing or you want to be represented is really um, important. And I, I, have to, I keep going back to this L LW, Lesbians Who Tech, LWT conference, because they do it so well. Um, and they have managed to bring in senior people from all walks of um, tech communities um, that represent, they're out there, you know, it's, and they, you know, if you ask them and bring them together um, and, and you mix them with the junior folks, you can create these and they've managed to create a very nice safe space and a nice model for doing this. But the, there's the huge risk as well and um, of being out or being on stage and getting trolled, which I think we were trolled a little earlier and I think Chris shot somebody yeah. down. Um, yeah. So it's it happens every day, um, and and creating the systems and the spaces is really um, what I'm interested in doing, and doing it um, with thoughtfulness um, as well. So uh, I think I think there's a way of doing it, um, and and that 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 there's a way of doing it that um, allows everyone to participate in a safe healthy, engaged way and trying to create those spaces, um, whether it's in tech or outside of tech in our communities um, and in different cultural spaces. So maybe let you guys have the last words here as we're running towards the end of the hour. And Sasha? You know, one of the things I, I think about when I think about what Sasha is talking about is um, kind of one of the ally skills that I, that I try to talk about when I talk to people about allyship is that one of the most important questions to ask um, as, as the privileged side of the, of the conversation is uh, what, do you, what, do you want, what do you want to have happen? What, what is it that you would like to have happen and how can I help you have that happen? And so in the case of like, I am responsible if I put a junior person on stage, maybe the conversation has to be more like, I want to put you on stage. Here's the risks that you would take if you went on stage. Here are the things that I can do if you if those things happen. What would you like to have happen? So I'm not going to make the decision now whether or not you need to be on stage. I'm offering something to you. You need to be responsible for it, and I will do everything I can to minimize the harm to you. But I, I think that, that, that it's important that one of the things that we recognize is that trolling is an attempt to remove agency from people who don't have agency already. And we need to intercede and put ourselves in the middle of those conversations and say, I can't protect you from a, a Twitter mob, but I can do these things if you decide you want to go on stage. And I, I think it's important that you're here and you're seen. Um, I I want to just like, sorry, I'm a little bit dismissive of this argument because 
like you know there's there's really bad things that happen to people like getting attacked by a, a mob on the internet or getting death threats to their address and stuff like i this is not and it can happen to anybody right we have this like just world fallacy right we're like oh she was dressed a certain way or she looked a certain way or she's not a real developer or like, i'm saying she whatever um you know that person deserved this in some way they did something they were too spicy on the internet i don't know right um but no it just happens someone just picked you because you looked a certain way and they're now in your life and destroy you and there's nothing you jabe can do to protect that person literally nothing so if we go into like very bad scenarios, like I I don't I don't think I can do enough to protect. I can protect someone from a violation of code of conduct inside my conference space, yes, but I can't do much more than that. And I don't know, the, the, it, I don't have a solution to this. I just I think it's a big problem. I guess, I guess my argument is that I think that. Yeah, I, I used to have this argument with a boss of mine who he'd come by and say, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and if you don't do it, I'll be responsible. I'm responsible for everything around here. And I was like, that's a weird idea that you're responsible for everything, including my my failures. Like, you're not responsible for everything. I If you don't want to share the responsibility, then you that just – it's – so I, I get frustrated – because I think the the argument that I was trying to make was not that you could protect them, but that you can be clear about what you're able to do and, and what you're not able to do and what the actual risks are and then help them make a decision. Because I, 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 I don't understand, I don't under, I, I don't know how to go from I feel like I am putting people at risk and therefore I think the conclusion to that sentence is therefore I don't want to put people on stage. That doesn't seem like that. That seems like the trolls are winning that argument. <laughs> I, 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 think, I think the point Jay's also making is that you're giving them the agency instead of holding the agency for yourself, right? So that that no one can protect anyone. That's the reality. That's the reality. No one can protect anyone. Not sure. I agree. I, I, I hold on. I I understand. Um the agency point and I understand that like I'm taking responsibility for a thing you know that I you know I can also offer I, I, obviously no one has to be on stage or in the boardroom or wherever right like everybody has an agency and decides to take this risk but I'm also saying that people don't always understand what comes with that risk right and I do feel responsible if I am trying to lift someone up and they get abused because of that I do feel responsible right if I invited someone to an MVP community and now they're getting death threats because I did that it's a little bit on me um now my answer to that in the not letting the trolls win is exactly the gradual change right like because I can make sure that I have this gradual influx of people who look differently into the community up to the point where it becomes normal and someone doesn't get attacked because they're Chinese or whatever, right? Um, so let me ahead. frame it just slightly differently. So knowing what you know now, in the next opportunity to put someone like that on the stage, will you not do it? I will absolutely do it, but I just, I don't want to be dismissive of, like, Rich. yes. I, I don't want to say that if I create a conference and I put 50 LGBTQ people on stage, that would automatically solve their presentation problem. Like, like I just, yeah, I, I don't think that, yeah. No, I, I don't think anyone thinks that. Yeah. I personally. I, I think this what I the point that I was trying to make with the LWT folks is that they have had no problem once they committed to putting that many people on stage to finding that many people on stage because they we are out there um, they are out there and so I have a little bit of a problem just a little bit with the gradualness because it's I'm I'm older probably than all of you on the here right now. And so when I started in computer science back in the dark ages, there were more women in tech and in those programs than there are now. So there, the, so, and we went from being there to disappearing for a while to coming back now. And so for me, um, and, and 
and this is, I keep saying this to people is that they're out there, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who are in senior positions at, that are quite willing to speak. We just have to ask. Th and this is an people, even deeper what, topic than we have time for. Yeah. yeah. But, I but, say, but at one, one point, one women piece. were feminized. Go, go ahead. Sorry. One more thing. And we're talking about the stage here. And I, what the stage is just where we see ourselves, Sasha, right? When we go to conference and stuff. But the work of the harder work is getting it into the organizations, to getting more people into uh, positions in companies and in tech and visible too. So I want to make sure that we we keep saying I keep saying yep. stay, stage, but I want that, and I, and I actually think that that we just don't do a good enough job um, looking and asking people um, for to be visible and at, but do it in a safe way and responsible way. So I I mean I'm. There are people out there who are quite willing to talk. It's just finding them and making the effort. I will absolutely agree with you that stage was a metaphor for being visible, being leadership, right? It's it's not about, you know, being at a conference. I, I have so many things to say. I'm just going to, you know, we can save all it for some other time because, like, there's literally too much to dig into. Um, but I do appreciate the way this conversation got. Like, I, I think... We don't have enough of these conversations, right? Like we said, no shades of gray usually. So, like, I, I appreciate this. So we have every the, Friday. So go for it, Andrew. Have a, have another. With, couple. Well, the, the, you made a point that I think is very interesting, and I thought a little bit about, and I think some people understand, but and, you know, and, and you sort of alluded to this. At some point, computing was considered women's work, mm -hmm. right? So, so like this whole idea. That that's like dominated some of these conversations and some of these spaces about what what people are capable of or not capable of it is literally unfounded and it, it's literally it's like fashion and tribalism drives drives the dynamic more than any sort of evidence. But but that dynamic changed at some point when you know the power, the money, the rest, and they uh -oh. pushed out they pushed out the the women essentially. Yeah. And, and and the rest, right? So it's like you the the hidden figures movie kind of puts a nice um, historical framing and lens where like we literally couldn't have, have dirt done things with with spaceflight without the the calculations and capabilities of one um, black woman. Like that's just it's it's absurd to to see some of these conversations that we have to have. Yeah. Genevieve Bell does this great talk where she talks about the fact that. England, when it was first wired, was wired with two wires, no ground. So they needed to basically rewire all of England to a three ground uh, to a three wire grounded system, and um, so they didn't have enough electricians. And so what they did was they printed up the instructions on how to rewire your house on tea napkins, and they sent it to every house in England. And the idea was that they were going to convince women homeowner, you know, women who stayed at home to rewire their own houses. And they did. And the thing about it is that the moment the tipping line tipped to there were more houses with grounded wiring than not grounded wiring, it made being an electrician a highly profitable thing all of a sudden. You, you need to go rewire all the rest of the houses and all those others. And guess what? The women who did the original work to rewire most of England were prevented from becoming professional electricians. They were not allowed to, they weren't allowed to be paid for the knowledge that they had. And you see the same types of things happening in computing. Early computing, it wasn't particularly profitable to be a, uh, a programmer. When it, suddenly you can get six figures the first year out of school, well, maybe we don't want the girls to play over here. We, like, we kind of like making all the money. Let's just, we'll just diminish their contributions and ignore them so that we can keep all the profits for ourselves. And, you know, only, only recently now when we have a talent gap, do, do all of a sudden there's a concern for how we get as many people back in the system as possible. I just think, you know, the economics behind this stuff is really gross um, and, 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 you know, pretty clear. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So maybe Sasha, we'll let you have the last word in here. Uh, I, yeah, I, I could just keep going, right? So I, I'm just not going to. Right? <laughs> um, 
I think, you know, th- we kind of maybe didn't go, Diane, where, where you wanted to go with this, uh, but I think it was useful. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think I would appreciate if we, I personally would appreciate if we tried to find common ground rather than sort of radic- radicalizing, because I think, like I said, I don't think good things come out of revolutions. Uh, almost every revolution in history was a shit show. So um, I I don't, I would rather we found ways to come together and um, agree on things than we sort of blew up the entire system to redistribute power because in the end of it, usually the power doesn't land very well anyway, so. Yeah. No, I think, uh, I think we're gonna have this conversation again um, and and I think that it's it doesn't matter that we didn't maybe adhere to the the topic of creating allies because I think in having uh, this conversation we're doing some of that work. So um, I, and I really appreciate you coming, Sasha, and helping us spur this conversation a little bit further because there's so many more layers to this onion um, that we can peel back. Um, I just you know tons of things we could we could talk about like. But I'm going to let you go because I want to respect everybody's time today. And thank you. And we'll, you know, if you have questions for Sasha or Andrew or Jabe or myself or Chris, um, hit us up on um, the internet um, in Twitter land, wherever you live, Divine Ops, I'm Python DJ. There's little idea and your, I don't know how to pronounce yours, Saitan. Is that, is that Saitan? Okay, that's how you say it, Saitan. Um, find us. Um, we're happy to, all happy to talk about this. Um, and we will be talking about this more in the future. So thanks, Sasha, for taking the time today. Back to the revolution. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, Sasha. I, I think we're going to, have to change the theme music for this or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's all good. Thank you very much, guys. Talk soon. Bye. Cheers.